So anyway, guys, uh, today um, the topic that I've elected to uh, give my two cents worth on is uh, professional survival. And anyway, I got some new things here set up. I've got some, uh, I've got like a little teleprompter kind of thing going on here and it's stuff I'm really not used to. I haven't played with it much. So I hope you just bear with me and then that way we can uh, get right to the meat of this matter. And uh, so if I'm looking back and forth away, uh, you'll know that it's uh, something a little bit different. But anyway, here we go. So anyway, as I mentioned today, the topic is indeed professional survival. Um, as you guys know, at the, mo at the end of most of my videos, I'll say something like stay safe. And I think that we all know that usually that's about our physical safety because that's a really huge part of our job. Um, but there's an element of our job where we also take on a lot of professional risk based on what we do. And when you're out there and you're uh, giving orders and you're using force and you're applying handcuffs to people and you're reading people their rights, there's a risk to some of this stuff where you can be held civilly accountable, you can be held criminally accountable. And so anyway, there's a lot of things in, um, in case law and in policy procedure and the penal code and stuff that can help to actually keep us uh, pretty safe if you know what you're doing. And so that's what this uh, little lesson is about. So anyway, um, you should think of uh, policy really as your shield. You know, if you, if you stay within the bounds of your shield, you don't get anything splattered on you that can necessarily hurt you. Um, but there's uh, elements to that. And the first thing that we have, of course, is policy and procedure. We need to stay within that. Uh, the next things that we look to are the penal code. Um, we have to stay within, you know, um, our operating dictates, our duty and stuff as it's outlined in the penal code. And then finally, um, and this one is, is really huge, is case law. If you know about case law and you know how that's been applied in the past and big Supreme Court decisions and stuff, it can really save your bacon because sometimes... Um, people just, you know, start the ball rolling without knowing any of this stuff. And if you're ahead of the game and you've applied it and you've done things to where you can show how you were justified in what you did, you know, you can stop a bad thing happening in your career before it even gets started. So anyway, the thing I'm going to introduce you to here is a nice 14 letter word called reasonableness. And the reason that we're going to look at that particular word is because of a Supreme Court decision that was called Graham versus Connor. So anyway, just bear with me and I'm going to lay this all out to you and I'm going to tell you what happened in this thing. And uh, I'm looking back and forth here to my teleprompter and stuff. Uh, it's just because I'm a whole lot better at rolling along extemporaneously, but I got to make sure that I cover everything that's actually in this that I, that I wrote down. So anyway, this guy Graham and his friend, they get pulled over by the police. They hadn't committed any crime. Or they hadn't done anything wrong. And um, the police end up using force on Graham. Uh, his foot ends up broken. He had uh, lacerations on his wrists, a bump on his forehead, miscellaneous bumps and bruises and other various parts of his body, right? So, now I know what you're thinking, that sounds really bad, sounds really terrible, right? Not so fast. We've got to flush a little bit of this out. And that's one of the things that's important about, uh, about your report writing and stuff is, is you need to be able to not just paint a picture, but you need to bring every bit of the totality, this is important now, the totality of circumstance to bear in your case when, when something happens. So, anyway... Officer Graham, or rather, Officer Connor, rather, watched Graham and his friend pull up to a convenience store. The friend runs in and then runs right back out and they speed away. So the officer pulls him over and he radioed this in. And as soon as he gets him pulled over, Graham jumps out of the car and starts running around the car like a crazy person. This ends up where um, him and some other officers that arrived on scene had to handcuff Graham. And during that, a scuffle ensued, a little bit of resistance. They end up uh, breaking his ankle, putting some scuffs and bruises on him. I think the cuffs uh, might have uh, caused some small lacerations on his wrist and stuff. 
So, anyway, um, the friend and Graham, though, what had happened was is they had pulled up to this convenience store because Graham was having a diabetic emergency. All right, so his friend runs into the store and grabs some uh, orange juice and runs back out and then they're headed to go to the hospital and stuff. And basically, when the officer sees this, he thinks that there is a possibility that a robbery has occurred. When he gets him pulled over and Graham starts running around the car and doing all, the, all this crazy stuff, it ends up in a use of force situation. And then what eventually happens is um, after they've sorted everything out, um, they take Graham home and they release him and that was the end of it. But it wasn't the end of it civilly for Officer Connor. Um, the resulting use of force, of course, was due to the resistance, the bizarre behavior. But that was only later explained away by the diabetic emergency. The officer at the outset of this didn't have any clue in as to why this was actually going on. So, if you notice that what I did at the beginning of this, I explained the situation very poorly. And I let people jump to conclusions, right? Well, that's what happens um, when you've had an incident and you haven't explained yourself well or you haven't written it well and you haven't filled in all the blanks and you haven't been able to uh, justify this in front of people who are looking at it and they're jumping to conclusions right off. That's why it's really important to document your thought process and to be able to justify what happened. So, um, the next part of this is, is um, really, um, I wish everyone would actually, you know, check out, go online, it's easy, all, all you have to do is look it up, is Graham versus Connor and stuff, and read about the case, and read about what other people have to say about the case, not just me, but, um, but other people, because this really established the whole reasonableness idea. So, um, anyway, we have this, we have this, uh, we have this uh, concept of reasonableness handed down to us from the Supreme Court and saying that, yeah, um, no crime was committed, um, they didn't have any reason to uh, use force on him, um, but they didn't know that. At the time, they had probable cause because they thought that possibly a uh, robbery had taken place. Um, the guy was acting bizarrely. Yeah, it wasn't his fault, but they didn't know that either because strange stuff was going on because of the diabetic emergency. Did they act reasonably? Yes, they acted reasonably. And so that was why the Supreme Court found in favor of Officer, of Officer Connor. So the next part of this that I really want to take home to you is part of another case, but it really dovetail in um, very um, closely with what happened in Graham versus Connor. And this was a case called Johnson versus Glick. And uh, the reason that this one was so important is, is the specific wording of part of this case really um, helps protect us uh, from a lot of different things because, you know, things that happen at the time and while they're occurring may look different when you're viewing it backwards that 2020 hindsight Monday morning quarterbacking craziness that sometimes goes on by admins sometimes it goes on by the courts lawyers all those great people getting involved but this when you bring it out and you know that the Supreme Court said this this can give you a lot of shielding from something like that so I'm gonna quote here all claims that law enforcement officers have used excessive force in the course of an arrest are to be judged under the Fourth Amendment and its reasonableness standard. The question is whether the officer's actions are objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances confronting them at the moment. The proper perspective in judging an excessive force claim is that of a reasonable officer on the scene at the moment force was employed. Not every push or shove, even if it may later seem unnecessary in the peace of a judge's chamber, violates the Fourth Amendment. 
So there it is. That's a massive protection from the Supreme Court as long as there was objective reasonableness in what you did. So, going on from there. So how do you actually protect yourself? You have to know policy, you have to know procedure, you have to know penal code, you have to know case law. And when you write it, you have to put everything in. I, all these supervisors, oh, just give me the bare bones. No, if you've had a use of force or something that could be construed as depriving someone of their rights, you put everything in, you learn to justify it, you learn to put it in a context so that it's reasonable when looked at. So anyway, that's just what you have to do. You have to spell everything out showcase your thought process why did you decide to do what you did anyway i hope um, everyone out there will stay professionally and physically safe and i uh, also hope to do uh, more of stuff on this subject in the future so anyway um, if you like this thing be sure and uh you know hit me up on it we've got the uh we've got all of the ability to comment on stuff now again so anyway uh anthony i hope you watch this Hope you like it. We'll get it posted up as quick as we can. And anyway, stay safe professionally. Stay safe physically. All right, goodbye, guys.